Hey everybody, this is Franco, and in this video we are going to talk about using the setup wizard to configure the Centroid Acorn board. This video um, is number 10 in the series of videos where I was explaining how I was building a DIY closed loop CNC control system for a mini lathe, but whether or not you're working with a mini lathe and whether or not you've watched the other nine videos, this one could be useful to you if you're configuring your acorn board for the first time and you want to see how the wizard works. I apologize for the video quality. I have to film this with my camera because I'm going to pick up some live items and put them in front of the camera. Otherwise, I would have used the screen capture program and the video would have been a little clearer. So hopefully everything will at least be, um, you'll be at least be able to see what I'm doing. But my, my apologies for the flicker, if there's any flicker on the screen. So let's just talk about this really quick. The first thing I want to show you, actually, isn't even the setup screen. I want to show you this. So in the other videos, we kept referring to this wiring diagram. And this is the, well, you can read it. This is the Acorn Rev3 Connections Lead Shine DM Series Stepper Driver. And I like this wiring diagram because I believe, you know, if you're using a lead shine, great. But I think you can refer to this wiring diagram for many step and direction drivers. So I think it's a really good example. In fact, when people ask me about the Acorn, this is usually the first diagram I point them towards. So this is a good reference. We've been using this to build the, uh, make the connections in the control box. And I would recommend, if you're doing this, that you follow this wiring diagram exactly. Follow it just like it's shown. And Centroid updates these from time to time, and that's great. So if you're using this and you have an updated version of this diagram, that's okay. It's just going to look a little bit different. But follow the diagram. Just do what it says. Now, in my earlier videos, you'll notice, if you've been watching them, you'll notice that I did deviate just slightly. I hooked up my uh, limit switches to input 6 and 7. Well, prior to shooting this video, I've gone back and I've changed that. So I've put my first home limit on input 1 and my second home limit on input 2 just to be completely consistent with this wiring diagram. So my point is, when you're, when you're doing your project, just follow the wiring diagram. And here's why this is like this. You know, if you're a Mach 3 person and you're converting over to the Acorn, you may be thinking about, you know, your old Mach 3 ways. And in the Mach 3 world, you know, you're kind of on your own. Maybe you could get some help on a forum or, or something like that. But you kind of had to get used to just figuring everything out on your own, and you expected there would be some issues. And then you figured out how to resolve those issues, right? So that, that's how it was, and, you know, that's okay. But the people at Centroid, they really do want to make your life easier. And they, they really want all their customers to be happy. They're, uh, you know, they're a really nice organization. So that's why they make these wiring diagrams. That's why they made the wizard. And uh, follow the wiring diagram. And if you do, your life is going to be a lot easier. You're going to be on the happy path. So if you follow this wiring diagram, make all the connections just like it's shown here, your life is going to be a lot easier when you come into the wizard. And here's why. You'll notice there's all these radio buttons up here. And when you click on them, settings change. I don't know if you can see that, but as I'm clicking through here, all sorts of settings are changing. Well, there's lots of settings in the background to configure a CNC machine, and uh, you know you can drive yourself crazy um, going through all of those. And here again, that's sort of how life was in Mach 3. You had all your, your settings in Mach 3, then if you had plugins, you had to go through all the plugins, and there was just a lot to think about. Well, here in the Centroid, they've, they've really tried to sim simplify that. So if you followed this wiring diagram, if you followed it, then you want to click on this radio button where it says lead shine. And if you click on that, you're going to notice that, well, here, you'll see all these settings correspond with the wiring diagram. So input one was first axis home limit, input two, second axis home limit, input five, drive OK, input eight, e-stop OK. You'll notice that all matches up with what's shown on the wiring diagram. So 
I just wanted to emphasize that. If you follow the directions and the documentation from Centroid, there's actually some thought put behind it. It's going to make your life easier. And when you go to ask for help, if you jump on the forum or if you're trading emails with the Centroid people, it makes their life a lot easier if you followed you know, their instructions. If you've deviated from them, you know, the more you deviate from them, the, the harder it is for people to help you. So I highly recommend that you, um, you know, just do things the way that they've asked you to do them, unless you have a really good reason not to. Then, you know, by all means, go through and change things. But let me, you know, let me just show you what happens if you change something. Um, I don't know, let's just change a bunch of stuff here. See what happens? Now it's going to say custom lead shine. You're no longer on the happy path. You're on your own path which might be a good path, but um, it's your path. So I recommend if you're new to this and you're just getting started, just click on lead shine, follow the wiring diagram. Okay, um, so input one, input two, these are your limit switches. And let's see here, I, I think I uh, inadvertently already messed myself up. So let me just go back to lead shine and I know I want everything to be normally closed. So I'm sorry, I got a little click happy here while I was making the video. So here again, pick lead shine, let it take all those defaults and make sure that uh, you know what you have in the wiring diagram is what's on your screen. So input one, first axis home, input two, second, second axis home, input five is drive okay, input eight is e-stop okay, Everything is normally closed. All of these are your outputs. I'm not actually using any of the outputs on my configuration, but I'm gonna leave them, let the default settings there. It doesn't hurt anything. Um, I just don't physically have anything connected to these. All right, that all looks good. Let's go to access configuration. All right, this is a really important tab, really important tab. First thing I wanna point out is up here is your machine units. Imperial inches, you know, you can go metric if you want to. I'm going to leave it an imperial inches because that's just what I'm used to. Now you have your axes. Axis one, axis two, three, four. Notice axis one is the z-axis. I know this is a little counterintuitive. Usually you think x, y, z. Well, when you're configuring the board and you're making your connections, axis one is the z-axis. That messes people up. So that's a point worth overemphasizing. Axis one is Z, axis two is X, and this is for a lathe. If you know, you're working with a milling machine, the screen will look a little different. All right, now we have some uh, really, like I said, even more, more important settings. Steps per revolution. What is steps per revolution? What does this mean? Now you notice I have both of these set to 2000. I'll try to give you the best explanation I can. Pick up your driver, if you're using a driver, this is a DM542A. This is not the driver I used to build this control box, but I, I just have this laying around, so it's easy for me to put my hands on it. So that's why I'm going to use it. If you look at your driver, you're going to see, either print it on the driver or in the, instruction, in the instructions that came with the driver, you're gonna see these directions. Pulse per rev table. So let's just say that I want 2,000 pulses per rev. So what that means is how, how many pulses does it take to make the, the stepper motor make one revolution? So I would have set these dip switches, I would have set them to off, on, on, off. And that way, when you just pick up your stepper motor and, and, and look at it, it now requires 2,000 pulses to make one revolution of the stepper motor shaft. Forget about the rest of the machine, just think about the motor and the shaft. 2,000 pulses to make one revolution on the stepper motor shaft. That's what you put right here, steps per revolution. How many pulses does it take to make that stepper motor make one revolution of the, of the shaft? That's what you wanna put here. It's all about the stepper motor. Don't forget about the rest of the machine for this setting. Just how many pulses does it take for that stepper motor to make one revolution? So there again, 2,000 
Those are the values that go there. Now the next one is overall turns ratio. So what is this? Well, this is the machine. In fact, let's, let's see what pops up here on the, the help tip. It says, overall turns ratio is a mechanical ratio between axis motor and the machine. So what this is, this is the number of revolutions the motor shaft has to make to cause the axis to move one inch. So just to, to make that clear, let's, we're, we're taking this step by step. So steps per revolution, we entered 2,000 because it took 2,000 pulses to make one revolution on the stepper motor shaft. Now overall turns ratio is how many revolutions of the stepper motor shaft is required to travel one inch. So let's just think about this. So here's a ball screw, and let's just say this is a, a five millimeter pitch ball screw, which is a very popular ball screw. That's not what this one actually is, but let's just pretend it is, that it's a, a five millimeter pitch ball screw. Now let's just pretend that your stepper motor was connected right to, right to the shaft. It was coupled right to it. Well, in that case, if that were the case, then that stepper motor would have to turn its shaft 5.08 times to travel one inch. And that's how a lot of machines are connected. It's the, the stepper motor is connected right to the, the shaft of the ball screw or the lead screw. So how many times does that stepper motor have to rotate to make this nut travel one inch? Now there's other scenarios. Let's just imagine that you have a, uh, a timing gear set up, right? Let's, let's just say you had a belt going here. Now, you're, now your stepper motor is down here driving a belt, right? And you're going through two pulleys. Let's just say your pulleys are not both the same size. Let's just say you have like, you know, some mechanical uh, gear reduction going on here or, you know, pulley reduction. You got to do the math. You got to go figure out, you know, Look, you got to look at the pitch of your ball screw. You got to look at the number of teeth on each, each pulley. You have to do the math. And then you got to figure out here how many times does the shaft on the stepper motor have to rotate to travel one inch? All right, I think I talked about that enough. I think you get the idea. Um, so for my machine, my Z-axis, I have to re return 5.08 revolutions to go one inch. My X-axis, because I'm using the stock lead screw, is 25.4 revolutions to travel one inch. Now, I can tell you this is a pretty big number. Usually, you know, if you're using one of my mini lathe conversion kits, you'll, you'll use this number, but if you're using uh, ball screws, you'll generally see numbers that look more like this. Um, all right, the next setting, lash comp. This is just what it is. And if you read the tip, um, units are in inches or millimeters, depending on metric set. Okay, yeah, so this is, this is backlash. So that when you build your machine, you get it running, you measure how much backlash there is in each axis and you enter the values here. Um, so when you're starting out, you'll start out at zero. I already know what my backlash is, so I've, I've put the values in. The next settings, fast jog, slow jog, max rate. Max rate is the ac absolute max velocity of each axis. Uh, fast jog is how fast you want the machine to jog when it's in rabbit mode. So I, I in this situation, you know, I don't have my sh machine moving very fast, so my, my fast jog is the same as my max rate. Slow jog is how fast you want the machine to move when it's in turtle mode. I have it going nice and slow because when I'm in turtle mode, I'm usually getting up really close to the part and I don't want to chip the tool, right? I want to move really slow. So turtle mode, slow jog, I have it going five inches a minute. Fast jog, I have it going, you know, basically as fast as the machine can go. Acceleration and deceleration this is the time in seconds it takes for the axis to accelerate to the max rate. 
So I, I asked Centroid what good settings are here for this, and they said a good place to start for stepper motors is somewhere between 0.3 and 0.5. So I have it set to 0.4 right in the middle. If you make this value too small, right, this is, this is saying how, how quickly do I accelerate the motor? If the value is too small, you're going to try to accelerate too fast and you're going to lose steps. If you make the value too big, um, all you're going to do is slow your machine down and you'll hear it when you change direction. You'll hear it, you know, you'll hear it accelerating and decelerating, right? So go with the, the recommended settings, make it somewhere between 0.3 and 0.5 and uh, start there and then use your machine. If you find you can, if you find you can reduce this value, great. You can um, experiment a little bit and you, then you can really see how quickly you can accelerate and decelerate. Direction reversal. Oftentimes when you build your machine, for whatever reason, you may need to actually reverse the mechanical you know, direction of the axis. That's the case on my machine. I have to reverse Z axis, but X axis is fine just as it is. This is where you want to do that. Use this setting right here to reverse the direction of an axis if it's necessary. Now there's other ways to do it. If you're an old Mach 3 user, you may try to invert the uh, direction signal. But in Mach or in Centroid world, don't don't do that. Try to use this setting right here, direction reversal. Drive enable delay. This is just the number of milliseconds you delay to enable the drive when you're first powering it up. Uh, use the defaults. Homing type. If you have limit switch or home limit switches, then you want to pick home to switch. If you don't have home switches or limit switches, just pick simple home. Simple home, you'll manually jog the machine to a mark and then you'll say I'm at zero. If you have switches, then pick home to switch. Homing direction. This is the direction the axis will move to find the switch. So if you have the switch positioned at the positive end of the travel, then you'll want positive. If you have the switch at the negative side of the travel, pick negative. I have my switches at the positive side, so I'm going to pick positive for both of them. Homing sequence. When you home your machine, this is the order that it's going to try to home in. So you'll notice it's three, two, one, well, Maybe this is a little confusing. There again, I'm just taking to the default settings. So what it's going to do is it's going to do, there, there is nothing connected to axis 3 or axis 4, so it's just going to ignore this one. But if there was something on axis 3, it would try to do that first. Then it's going to do axis 2, which is the x-axis, and then it's going to do axis 3, or axis 1, which is the z-axis. So basically, long story short, it's going to home x, then it's going to home Z. I believe that's probably what most people on a lathe will want to do. Travel limit plus travel limit minus. These are your soft limits. If you're used to talking that way from Mach 3, these are your soft limits. So for my x-axis, the positive soft limit is zero. The negative soft limit is two and a half inches. Um, for the z-axis, my positive limit is zero, and I, I've put 10 in for the travel of the z-axis. I'm going to make this number a little bigger. Um, I don't actually know what I want it to be. I'm just going to pick something right now. I'm going to say 14. Once I run the machine, I can figure out what I really want it to be. And this is, this is basically determining how close you let the carriage travel to the chuck. Fast probe rate doesn't really mean anything to me because I don't have a probe on this setup. Slow probe rate, same thing. I don't have a probe. I'm not worried about it. X1 jog increment. This is the setting that determines the fine increment for jogging. So I have it set to one one thousandth of an inch. Maybe some people on a lathe would like it to go to one tenth of one one thousandth of an inch. That's really up to you. Um, but just keep in mind there's three settings. So there's, there's fine, you know, there's one X, 10 X, and 100x. Um, I like I like this one one thousandth of an inch. So that's what I'm going with. Spindle setup. I don't use the acorn to control my spindle, but if I did, this would be the max RPM, minimum RPM. I do have an encoder. So if you've followed the wiring diagram, 
then hooking an encoder up is the easiest thing in the world. You just tell it, yes, I have an encoder. Spindle encoder counts. If you're using the encoder that I recommend, you want to set this value to, to negative 8,000. Why negative? Well, that's how you can reverse the, the polarity of the RPM. So let's just say you set it to 8,000. When I turn my machine on, what happens is when my spindle is going forward, it's showing a negative RPM. So in order to correct that, I just put a negative value in front of this. And now when I turn my spindle on and it's going forward, it actually shows a positive RPM. So 8,000 pulses per revolution because I'm using a, I'm using a 2,000 line encoder. You get four pulses per line, kind of. That's how you think of it. So 2,000 line encoder gives you 8,000 counts per revolution, which is really, really, really good. Uh, your spindle speed ratios, just leave them all set to one. Here again, I'm not using, I'm not controlling my spindle with the acorn, so it really doesn't matter. Touch screen, yes, I have a touch screen. USB machine control device, no, I, I don't have an X keys pad, so I'm setting that to no. Virtual control panel, yes, absolutely, that's the cool panel on the side of your screen. Yes, you want that. Okay, now these next two buttons, or settings, this is kind of top secret. This is something that Centroid is developing. I'm not allowed to tell you about this, but you're going to see some more about this in the future. When you see it, you're going to love it. You're all going to want to buy one, and it's awesome. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Password protection? No. There's nobody in my garage trying to hack into my CNC machine, so I'm not going to use password protection. But the reason why this is here is, remember, the Centroid software is developed for professional, it's a professional pro-grade CNC control software that's developed for industrial settings. So in industrial setting, you, you don't want your operators um, just jumping into all your machines and changing all your settings. You know, you'll mess everything up because they may or may not know what they're doing. So you put a password on your machine so people can't change the settings unless they know the password. I'm not worried about that because it's just me in my garage, so no password for me. Lathe setup, horizontal, right? You can have a horizontal or a vertical lathe. If you're doing a DIY conversion, it's pretty much always going to be horizontal. Tool orientation, front or rear. Here again, if you're doing a DIY CNC conversion, it's front. And what that saying is when you're standing in front of your machine, the tool is in between you and the center line of the machine, right? So the center line's going right through the chuck. My tool post is between me and the center line of the machine, so I'm going to say front. If this were a commercial CNC, it would probably be rear. That means you know your turret or your tool is behind the center line of the machine. So DIY conversion, you're probably going to be on front. Advanced axis, all right. So th this is where you would go if you need it to invert a signal. But don't do this unless you really, really need to do it. Now you'll notice I have all my drive enable signals inverted. That's because of the way I configured my drives. What I probably should have done is go in and reconfigure the drive and then I could have unchecked all these boxes, but I'm, I'm lazy so I'm not going to do that. But Generally speaking, it's probably best if none of these boxes are checked. Now remember we said if you need a reverse direction, you do it here on tab 2. That's the right place to do it. This is the wrong place to do it. If you need to reverse the direction of an axis, do not come here and check these boxes. This is maybe what you would do in Mach 3. Don't do that here in Centroid Acorn. Don't check these boxes if you need to reverse the direction. Go here to direction reversal and use these. So there you go. That's all I'm going to say about that. Axis pairing. This is a lathe, so we're not going to pair any axes. If you're on a router and you had two motors driving the y-axis, then you would pair them. A lathe, we're not pairing anything. Step rate, depending on how fast your drives can read signals, you may be able to set this to 400,000 steps per second. 
my drives aren't that fast, I have to leave it at 200,000 steps per second. And that's probably the place to start. So I would say start there, 200,000 steps per second. DB signal mapping, so this is really cool. So the Acorn has this DB25 plug, right, that you can use to, you know, certain drives and like a Gecko G540, you can just plug right in with the DB25 cable. I'm not configured that way right now, but I, I need to show this to you. Um, you can remap, right? You can, you can change the settings here to remap what pin does what. I'm not using this right now. So what I have to do is I, I have to come over here. I want to pick, I'm just going to pick default, not, you know, not one of these other settings. I'm just going to pick default and I'm not connected through the DB25. I'm connected through the screw terminals, right? So I need to pick that. And I'm not remapping anything, so I have enable mapping turned off. Now, if you are connecting through a DB25 uh, connection on the Acorn to go, some, go through some legacy device, you can enable mapping, you can turn it on, and you can remap these pins to be whatever you need them to be. And this is a really cool feature. This is, this is pretty awesome. And there's, there's probably some scenarios where connecting through the DB25 connection is better than going through all the uh, terminals on the Acorn board, but I'm using the screw terminals because that works well for me. That's how it's shown on this wiring diagram. So I am going to pick default, header selection, screw terminal, terminal, and enable mapping is off. Those are the settings that I want. And if you do all that, and then you're happy, you've done everything right, you press right settings, and what it's going to do is write a, a configuration. Yes. That tells you that it was done correctly. And now what I'm going to do is I am just going to launch the application. All right. So there we go. Um, I'm just going to press reset here, or east, uh, hit reset the e-stop. That's a safety thing. And what I can do now is I can say, well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to jog my axes just to get a little closer to my limit switches. All right. And now I'm going to home out my machine. And you can see it's searching for the uh, limit switches or the homing switches. So while it's doing that, I'm just going to bring out a point. If you're an old Mach 3 user and you accidentally would bump into one of your limit switches, uh, if, if you recall what you had to do there, you had to go in and find, I believe it was on the diagnostic screen, you had to release the, east, or release the limit switch, override the limit switch, and then you had to jog off your limit switches and you had to hope that you went in the right direction because if you went in the wrong direction you're going to smash your limit switches or bust, up, bust things up or do whatever bad thing happens when you um, run in the wrong direction, right? Uh, what I like on the Centroid system is there's, there is really no uh, override for these homing switches, right? So if you, if you tag one of them and you didn't mean to do it, the software just won't let you go any further in that direction. It will let you go in the opposite direction to get away from it, but it won't let you uh, crunch your limit switches. So that's a nice thing. Let's just check that here. I'm going to press tool check just to go over in a... So here we go. All right, I'm jogging. Let's just say... Actually, I'm not even sure. Here, I'm going to fool it. I'm going to psych it out. Let's just say, all right, see what happened? It thinks, I'm, I just have my finger on the switch. It thinks that the switch is triggered. And if I can balance this camera while I do it, what it won't let me do is it won't let me go any further. But what it will do is let me come off the switch. So that's just a simple point. It's one of the benefits of going with the system. 
Um, there are many. There's a lot of benefits. That's just, you know, the simple one to demonstrate, and I wanted to show that to you. So it's very intelligent with the way they handle their homing switches and uh, the way the machine jogs. And the moral of the story is, and this is for all you Mach 3 guys like me, if you're an ex Mach 3 user and you're thinking about all these things that you used to have to do in Mach 3 to make Mach 3 work, now if you come over to Acorn, you may instantly start searching for those strategies and you may not find them and you might start to get nervous like, oh man, I can't find the, you know, the limit override button. What am I going to do if I, if I hit a limit switch and I can't get off of it? Well, you kind of just have to be patient because most of those problems are not even a problem in the Acorn, in the Centroid system, right? The Centroid people have been selling the software for a long time. They're used to dealing with machinists and machine shops. You know, these, most of these guys, they don't have time for headaches, right? They need to run their business. So a lot of the things that you may imagine are going to be a problem aren't a problem with the Acorn system. So you just kind of have to trust them, follow their documentation, and um, you're, uh, I think you're going to be happy. I know I really am. I have no, no regrets converting over to the Acorn system. I, I actually don't even, I don't have any machines running Mach 3 anymore. Okay, well, I guess that's all we need to say about that. And uh, thanks for watching this video. Sorry it got a little bit too long, but you know, you can always uh, put me on fast talking mode if you get a little bored with my uh, rambling here. But there's a lot of good, got a lot of good information here. I hope it was helpful. Thanks for watching and be safe.